The first thing that I want to mention is that this is a webinar based on a guidelines document that was published about a month ago in the Journal of the American Society of Echocardiography, and everything that I'm going to say is a reflection of that document. Uh, it's a great resource and a great reference, and if you haven't seen it or are not familiar with it, I would encourage you to uh, use it as, as a resource. It, it's a really wonderful document. I would be remiss if I didn't tell you about the amazing collaborators that, uh, that went into producing this document. This represents a collaboration between uh, adult and pediatric cardiologists, between imagers and interventionalists. It includes sonographers, and it includes a representation of people from all over the world. And we're really excited to present this material to you about uh, how to image atrial septal defect in Peyton Foreman O'Valley. Uh, I've included on the first slide my disclosures, which are really not relevant to this uh, conversation, but I put them in there anyway. And there's a standard disclaimer that this is information being provided for a CME activity and does not substitute for independent medical judgment. The learning objectives for, for this evening's activity after completing, the participant should be better able to appropriately use transthoracic transesophageal and intracardiac echo to evaluate and characterize atrial septal abnormalities, be able to recognize the echocardiographic parameters necessary to interrogate the normal atrial septum and facilitate a comprehensive assessment of atrial septal defect, patent frame and ovale, and aneurysms of the atrial septum, to define the relevant echocardiographic features important to identify patients appropriate for percutaneous intervention and to assist in the selection of size and type of device being used to recognize the strengths and limitations of each type of echo technique, be it transthoracic, transesophageal, or intracardiac echo for the evaluation of the interatrial septum, and to explain the role of echocardiography in the assessment of patients following surgical and transcatheter interventions for atrial septal abnormalities. And that's a pretty tall task to get through in an hour with question and answers. This is the outline for the material that we'll be presenting. We'll go over a brief overview of the document and what its objectives are. We'll go over the general imaging approaches with each of the echo modalities. We'll review anatomic defects and their associated imaging. We'll go through the important role of three-dimensional echo. And then we'll talk briefly about guidance of percutaneous transcatheter closure. The document at a glance, this is a real reference material, uh, and it can be used uh, for everyone in the audience uh, if they want more in-depth information. We're going to go quickly through the material in this session, but I encourage you to go back to this document and use it as a reference, use it as a resource for you as you, uh, as you learn and think more about the subjects. There are over 50 print pages of text and illustrations with key bullet points at the end of each section that summarize the essentials. Tonight, we're going to be going through the Cliff Notes version. There's 159 references. References, 55 color figures, 10 tables, and there are currently 28 online video files of many of the illustrations. So you can uh, go to the ASE, the, J, the Journal of American Society of ECHO website, and see these uh, video files, which I encourage you to do, which will only further amplify some of the illustrations. Now, some of the key points about imaging uh, as a, from a general standpoint, just to introduce the topic, is that everyone in this audience knows that we have a wide variety of modalities available for the assessment of atrial septal abnormalities. We've got transthoracic, transesophageal, we have 3D echo, and intracardiac echo. As a summary, transthoracic provides initial diagnostic information for the vast majority of abnormalities and serves an essential role in pediatric patients. Transesophageal echo, on the other hand, provides even better image quality to transthoracic, but it's not always required in all patients with atrial septal abnormalities. For example, if you have a patient with a PFO that you're not contemplating surgical or percutaneous closure, you may not need to do a TEE or any further imaging. 3D imaging provides a unique view of the atrial septum and in particular allows for an on FOSS view of an atrial septal defect and its surrounding structures. And this allows you to accurately determine the size and shape of an ASD, to delineate and measure the rims of surrounding tissue, and to determine the relationship of the ASD to the surrounding cardiac structures, which is critically important for percutaneous transcatheter closure. Echo is essential in patients undergoing transcatheter closure for appropriate patient selection, real-time procedure guidance, assessment of whether the device is, is effectively closing the, uh, the defect, assessing for complications, and in the long-term follow-up. So ECHO obviously plays a pivotal role in each and every one of these steps. So your first audience response question is, which of the following is an advantage of transesophageal ECHO over other imaging modalities, such as transthoracic or intracardiac ECHO, in guiding percutaneous transcatheter closure of ASD? 
This is an audience response question, so uh, the audience is encouraged to vote, vote early and vote often. Is it choice A, unlimited planes of interrogation of the atrial septum? Choice B, addition of 3D imaging, which facilitates delineation of the atrial septum and surrounding structures. Choice C, it's safe and non-invasive. Or choice D, that it offers interventional operator autonomy and no additional support is needed. So I'll give you a few moments to think about this question and enter the single best answer. Great. We're going to go and show the results. And um, I'll show you the intended correct answer, which is choice B, that the addition of 3D imaging facilitates delineation of the atrial septum and surrounding structures. Now, 31% of the audience said unlimited planes of interrogation of the atrial septum, and that's not completely incorrect either. Obviously, TEE offers multiplane capabilities, but transthoracic does offer the ability to rotate the probe and, and have nearly unlimited planes, and certainly intracardiac echo through physical manipulation of the probe through the steering controls and insertion, withdrawal, and rotation gives you uh, nearly unlimited planes as well. Certainly, TEE is not um, quite as a non-invasive as transthoracic echo, so that's not an advantage. And interventional operator autonomy is really a feature of intracardiac echo, as we'll talk about, where, in, where interventionalists can perform procedures and perform the imaging without having their echo colleagues come up to the lab and help them with the procedures. So one of the key features of the document is that we realize that there are different um, modalities of echo that are used in establishing the diagnosis of an atrial septal abnormality establishing whether a patient is a candidate for transcatheter closure, uh, for guiding that procedure, and for routine post-procedure follow-up. And we wanted to recognize the differences in the strengths and weaknesses of the modalities in each of these roles. So what you can see here on one of the tables from the document is that, for example, transthoracic echo is really pivotal in establishing the diagnosis of ASD or PFO but you may need to reach for transesophageal echo or intracardiac echo for determining patient eligibility for transcatheter closure, and you may need to reach for transesophageal echo, 3D echo, or intracardiac echo for guiding the procedure. For routine post-procedure follow-up, transthoracic echo is clearly uh, sufficient to establish uh, you know, that the device is functional and, the, and uh, there are no complications. So one key take-home point is that there are different modalities for establishing the diagnosis patient selection, guiding catheter closure, and following patients afterwards. And the different modalities depend a lot on the patient characteristics, whether we're talking about a pediatric or an adult patient or the actual size of the patient. Now, um, this is an, another important table from the document that really looks at the advantages and disadvantages of the different modalities in guiding transcatheter closure. As you can see from the table, transthoracic echo is readily available it's inexpensive, it's very non-invasive, patients are comfortable during their exams, and does offer nearly unlimited multiple planes to evaluate the interatrial septum. It doesn't require any additional sedation, and it offers excellent image quality in many patients. And it, in pediatrics, it really has a central role both in the diagnos diagnosis and in, uh, in some centers guiding procedures. But some disadvantages of transthoracic echo is that in larger patients or adult patients, images may be suboptimal and may be insufficient for determining patient selection, guiding procedures, et cetera. It requires a technologist or an echocardiographer to perform the study, and so during the transcatheter closure, additional echo support need to come to the lab. And the lower rim of, an, of the interatrial septum, which is important in ASD closure, is not well seen after device placement owing to shadowing from the device in virtually all views. Transesophageal echo, on the other hand, offers improved image quality over transthoracic echo, and certainly this is true in the adult patients that we see. It also offers the opportunity to perform 3D, which adds incremental value over the 2D technique in evaluating the size, shape, and location of atrial septal defects. 3D imaging provides on FOSS imaging that might be more intuitively understood to non-imagers, surgeons, or interventionalists. Now, the disadvantages of TEE in guiding these procedures is that it requires additional sedation or anesthesia to perform, and the risks include aspiration and esophageal trauma, which are obviously not present with transthoracic echo. Many centers require endotracheal intubation if you're going to do a prolonged procedure with TEE guidance. A shorter procedure may be able to be performed with conscious sedation and continuous monitoring of the airway. Either way, TEE requires additional echocardiographic operator to perform to be in the lab during the procedure, and there's the issue of patient discomfort. 
I do TEs for a living, and no one's ever asked me for another one. On the, on the final hand, intracardiac echo offers comparable image quality to transesophageal echo, and it can be performed under conscious sedation without any additional esophageal discomfort. It has been shown to reduce procedure time and fluoroscopy time, so it makes procedures shorter and more effective. And it has been shown to be superior to transesophageal echo in evaluating the inferior or the lower parts of the interatrial septum, which are an important segment to evaluate. It also allows interventionalists to perform the procedures autonomously. They can do their procedures without having any additional echocardiographic support. The downside of intracardiac echo is that it's invasive, that there are risks involved with an 8 to 10 French venous access and catheter, including vascular risks and arrhythmia. The role of 3D echo is still to be defined. It's only been recently introduced, and we're not quite there yet with understanding how to use 3D intracardiac echo. And obviously, this is very expensive technology. These are single-use catheters, which are quite expensive, and uh, that is a limitation as well. Some systems have limited far-field views, so if you're trying to see the whole heart, that can be a challenge. And there is the need for additional training of the intracardiac echo operator. It's extremely important that people that do ICE are expert in performing ICE. And I think that um, it goes without saying that um, really good ICE is with a well-trained operator and an expert operator is uh, quite sufficient for uh, inter in interrogating the atrial septum and guiding a procedure, but if it's poorly done, it doesn't add anything. And it does give the operator two tasks instead of one. Now they have to guide the imaging and perform the procedure, and uh, only having two hands, it can be challenging to perform both tasks at the same time. The next three slides go over the key views for transthoracic, transesophageal, and intracardiac echo uh, for assessing atrial septal anatomy. One of the central themes of the next three slides is we use multiple views and we're often rotating multiple planes through multiple views to completely interrogate the intraatrial septum. These are the views for transthoracic echo for atrial septal anatomy assessment, and I won't have time to read through all of them uh, in detail, but as you can see, the subxiphoid long axis and LAO view, the subxiphoid short axis or sagittal view, apical forechamber, and parasternal short axis views are all used to interrogate the multiple portions of the intraatrial septum, superior, inferior, anterior, posterior, and the six corresponding rims as well as the surrounding structures. And I would refer you back to the guidelines document for, to review these tables and these views, which are even better displayed in the document and online than they do on the slides. For transesophageal echo, there are five key views that we recommend for evaluating the intraatrial septum. The basal transverse from the mid to upper esophagus, a four-chamber view, a short axis view from the mid esophagus, a bicable view, and a long axis view. And a further uh, theme here is that we recommend that sequential multiplane angles are employed to slice through small increments of the structures of interest and ensure that we've interrogated it accurately. And this is especially important when 3D echo is not available and we're not going to acquire 3D volumes and then reconstruct them to look at on FOSS views and make measurements from that data set. So if we're performing 2D transesophageal echo, we want to get the five key views, but we also need to step through them in small 15-degree angles so that we're essentially interrogating the interatrial septum much like we would the mitral valve. And finally, intracardiac echo for evaluating the interatrial septum has three key views and one starting view, which we call the home view. The home view is the place that we start, and when we teach people to do intracardiac echo, the catheter is placed in a neutral position in the right atrium, and then the rest of the imaging sequence is choreographed from that point. The three key views for the interatrial septum are the septal view, the septal long axis, or a bicable view, if you will, and a septal short axis view. Now, I should point out that it is not really possible to obtain a true four-chamber view with intracardiac echo, and that's one of the limitations of ICE when you're thinking about assessing the rims of tissue around an atrial septal defect. Now, here's another audience response question. Again, we want to keep you interactive and we want to keep you involved in this. Um, and the question is, which of the following atrial communications represents a true defect in the atrial septum? Is it patent foramen ovale, osteum primum defect, osteum secundum defect, sinus venosus defect, or an unroofed coronary sinus? Now, I do realize that there may be more than one correct answer here, 
but I'd like you to choose the one that you feel most strongly about represents a true defect in the atri interatrial septum, and we'll discuss the choices. Okay, so let's see what, uh, what the group said. And again, I want you to realize that there are more than one correct answer here. Uh, our polling system doesn't allow for us to, uh, to allow you to input more than one correct answer, but the intended correct answers are osteum primum defect and osteum secundum defect. Patent foramen ovale, sinus venosus, and unroof coronary sinus are not true defects in the atrial septum, but they are interatrial septal communications nonetheless. Now, the document has a complete and detailed description of the embryogenesis of the atrial septum, and again, in the interest of time, I'm going to refer you back to the document for a more complete picture of how, how the embryogenesis works. But what I did want to point out is the type of atrial septal defects that you'll see, and you can see in this uh, nicely illustrated example here, the osteum secundum defect in the central part of the interatrial septum. You can see the sinus venosus SVC and IVC type defects here. You can see an osteum primum defect in the AV septum, and you can see a representation of an unroofed coronary sinus draining into the right atrium, and we'll go through these in a bit of detail. Now, osteum secundum defect occurs as a deficiency in septum primum. This is a situation that was designed to confuse medical students for centuries, and this is the most common form of ASD that you'll encounter. Osteum secundum is often amenable to percutaneous transcatheter closure, and it's important to point out that secundum defects can vary in shape and size, and they can be elliptical around or contain multiple fenestrations. Osteum primum defect occurs as a result of the failure of fusion of the endocardial cushions and live within the spectrum of AV septal, atrioventricular septal defects. So they're associated with BSDs and um, uh, tricuspid and mitral valvular abnormalities, including cleft mitral valve or a common AV valve. Now, sinus venosus defects, as well as coronary sinus defects, are not true ASDs per se. A venosus defect occurs as the result of the absence of the sinus venosus septum between the right upper pulmonary vein and SVC in the SVC type, or the right middle and lower pulmonary veins in the right atrium in the IVC type. Coronary sinus defect, also known as an unroofed coronary sinus, is also not a true ASD, but permits a left-to-right shunt from the left atrium to the coronary sinus and then to the right atrium. Now, this is an important slide that talks about the characteristics of atrial septal defects that should be routinely measured and reported. Obviously, we want to note the type of ASD. Is this a, a PFO, primum, secundum, or other type of atrial septal communication, as we've just mentioned? And we want to note the presence or absence of anomalous pulmonary venous drainage. We want to note do color Doppler flow, the presence of left to right, right to left, or bidirectional flow. We want to note the presence or absence of an atrial septal aneurysm, which we'll define shortly. We want to know if there are any other associated findings, such as a prominent eustachian valve or a fibrinous Chiari network in the right atrium. It's critically important that we measure the maximum and minimum diameter of the atrial septal defects, and this can be optimally measured from a 3D volume set. We can also measure the area of the atrial septal defect. We want to make note of the location of the ASD within the septum, and, it's, and I'll show you examples of how these locations can vary and how the variance can affect whether or not a patient is a candidate for percutaneous closure. We want to measure all of the rims of surrounding tissue, and we've defined six rims of tissue, the aortic, the right upper pulmonary vein, the superior, posterior, inferior, and AV septal rims. We want to make measurements of them in multiple views, as I've mentioned previously, sweeping through the plane so that we ensure we've captured the maximum and minimum uh, dimensions. We want to note the shape of the ASD, and this would be done with three-dimensional imaging. Is it round, oval, irregular, or multiple? And again, note the presence or absence of multiple fenestrations. We also need to um, note the dynamic nature of septal defects. We want to measure the area and maximum and minimum diameters, both end systole and end diastole. And when we're performing transcatheter closure, we'll also perform a stop flow diameter with balloon sizing where we apply color Doppler and we look for a cessation of color Doppler flow to indicate obstruction of the defect, and therefore that represents the uh, balloon size diameter of the, of the defect. Now, again, as I mentioned, only osteum secundum atrial septal defects are amenable to percutaneous transcatheter closure, and osteum secundum ASDs have six defined rims of tissue that surround them the aortic, atrioventricular valve, SVC, IVC, posterior, and right upper pulmonary vein rims. 
and a rim of less than 5 millimeters is considered deficient for purposes of transcatheter closure, but this is not an absolute contraindication to the procedure. Multiple rim deficiencies or extensive rim de deficiencies, as we'll define shortly, uh, do represent a yellow flag or a caution for performing transcatheter closure. Now, I have included some examples from the, do from the document on different types of atrial septal defects and different modalities used to image them. Uh, and again, I would refer you back to the document as well as the online video files for, uh, for further reference. This is an example of an osteum primum ASD from a transthoracic echo, and this is presented in the uh, standard pediatric display. You can see the defect, which is labeled, uh, in the apical fore chamber and the subcostal left anterior oblique views. You can also see a common atrioventricular valve indicated on the bottom in the subcostal LAO view. This is an example of an osteum secundum ASD from a transthoracic echo of a pediatric patient in the parasternal short axis view. Again, you can see the large defect, the deficient anterior aortic rim, and you can see the left to right color Doppler flow through this medium to large osteum secundum defect. This is an example of a different patient, again, in a pediatric patient with a pediatric display from both the subcostal LAO and sagittal subcostal views. And again, you can see a moderate to large osteum secundum atrial septal defect, and on the upper panel A, left to right color Doppler flow. Now, this is an example of a transesophageal echo and some of the key views that we use to define uh, the rims and to define the defect. Here you can see a mid-esophageal short axis view on the upper left, a bicaval view on the right, and on the bottom of the screen, the four-chamber view. You can see the posterior aortic rims in the short axis view, the right upper pulmonary vein and inferior cava rims in the bicaval view, and the posterior and AV valve rims in the four-chamber view. And again, this is an osteum secundum SD. This is a patient, a pediatric patient, with a sinus venosis IVC type defect, and you can see in the parasternal short axis view, left to right color Doppler flow from the left atrium to the right atrium. And you can see a large venosis defect on the subcostal views as well on the bottom right in panel B. Finally, these are some intracardiac echo views, again, because many of the audience may not be familiar with intracardiac echo. And you can see in panel A what we call the home view, where we start with the catheter in the right atrium, imaging the tricuspid valve, right ventricle, aorta, and right ventricular outflow tract. And notice that you don't see much of the intraatrial septum here. In panel B, we've rotated the catheter clockwise toward the intraatrial septum, so we're now imaging the fossa ovalis from the right atrium to the left atrium, and we're seeing a portion of the mitral valve, left ventricle, and left atrial appendage in panel B. In panel C, we've taken the same view, inserted the catheter several millimeters, and then applied uh, posterior and rightward flexion to the catheter to image the right atrium, intraatrial septum, and left atrium. Left pulmonary veins would be at the bottom of the screen if the depth was increased. Panel D shows a similar defect with greater depth, color Doppler imaging, and demonstrating a stretched PFO, and we'll cover PFO in a moment. And panel E shows an osteum secundum ASD as imaged by intracardiac echo from a short axis view demonstrating septum primum, the color Doppler flow, and deficient aortic rim, which hopefully you'll be able to see my mouse found the deficient aortic rim, which is right here, and the aortic valve right next to it here. Finally, this is an unroofed coronary sinus, not a true ASD, but an atrial septal communication nonetheless. And what you can see is uh, an, the left atrium opens up into the coronary sinus, and the coronary sinus opens up into the right atrium, and the color Doppler demonstrating a communication turbulent Doppler flow from left to right through this unroofed coronary sinus. So functionally a septal defect, but not a true defect in the intraatrial septum. Now, we haven't talked much about PFO, and I wanted to make a couple of key points about that as well. PFO is not a true deficiency of atrial septal tissue, but rather a potential space or separation between septum primum and septum secundum. And as everyone in the audience knows, this is incredibly common. It occurs in about 20 to 25 percent of the general population. It's defined by the demonstration of color Doppler flow, intracardiac shunting from right to left or left to right, or when contrast is injected into the right heart and passes over into the left heart. We can say that there's a stretch PFO present when the atrial hemodynamics are such that left atrial pressure has exceeded right atrial pressure, and we see left to right color Doppler flow, therefore acting as a functional atrial septal defect. 
Here's a diagram from the guidelines document indicating a PFO, and again, you can see the right atrial entry, a septum prima, septum secundum, and if the foramen were, were patent, you would see flow from right to left, either by color Doppler or via a contrast study. Now, the echo assessment of Peyton Freeman O'Valley includes the use of agitated saline contrast to identify the presence or absence of an atrial septal communication, and uh, the document has a complete protocol for how this should be performed. If catheter closure is being contemplated for PFO, which is controversial, a detailed evaluation of atrial septal anatomy should be performed using TEE or intracardiac echo. So again, the theme is if, if you're considering a catheter closure, to move up to either TEE or ICE to fully evaluate whether the patient is a candidate. This can be performed in the lab when the patient is undergoing the procedure, but it should be performed. When the PFO is in view with whatever modality you're using, agitated saline contrast is used to inject for right, uh, to evaluate for right to left shunt, and again, the protocol is in the document. Provocative movers such as a Valsalva maneuver should be performed to transiently increase right atrial pressure over LA pressure, and it is important to point out that sedated patients may have difficulty performing an adequate Valsalva, which is why TEE sometimes may be limited in this regard to provoke a right-to-left shunt. Now, the anatomic details that are important to note when, con when evaluating a PFO for possible transcatheter closure include the location of the PFO, because they don't all live in exactly the same place in terms of their in inlet and outlet in the right and left atrium, respectively, the thickness and extent of septum secundum, and whether there's any lipomatous hypertrophy or lipomatous change in septum secundum that may interfere with the device uh, closure, the total length of the atrial septum, the length of the PFO tunnel, if there is separation between septum primum and septum secundum, the size of the PFO at the right and left atrial sections, the distance of the foramen ovale from the vena cava and the valves and other surrounding structures, the presence or absence of an atrial septal aneurysm, and the presence or absence of any additional fenestrations or defects. Now, this is a transesophageal echo demonstrating a patient with a patent foramen ovale, and you can nicely see the overlap of septum primum and septum secundum, and the PFO indicated by the yellow arrow. The space between the two represents the left atrial septal pouch, which is a potential space even if the foramen is closed. And what you can see in this frame is color Doppler flow moving from the left atrium to the right atrium, indicating a stretched PFO or increase in left atrial pressure that has opened the PFO and has allowed communication to the right atrium. Now, this is an image from intracardiac echo. Now, remember, in intracardiac echo, we're imaging typically from the right atrium through the interatrial septum. So now the right atrium is on top, the left atrium on the bottom, and again, you can see the white arrow indicating septum primum, the yellow arrow indicating septum secundum, and the blue arrow in panel B indicating the stretched PFO with left to right color Doppler flow. Now, to define an atrial septal aneurysm, this is defined as the excursion of septal tissue of more than 10 millimeters from the neutral plane of the atrial septum into the atrium, or a total excursion of greater than 15 millimeters. And this is very nicely and easily demonstrated by M-mode imaging, where you can drop the M-mode cursor here. This is being performed on an intracardiac echo. And uh, what you can see here is a total excursion of 18 millimeters, which is the definition of uh, an atrial septal aneurysm. These are still frame images, which demonstrate uh, a highly mobile interatrial septum, uh, and you can also see the yellow arrow, arrow indicating separation of septum primum from septum secundum, i.e. an associated PFO. Uh, many patients with atrial septal aneurysm have associated PFO, and in most series, it's been reported up to about 60%. Now, what about the role of three-dimensional echo? 3D echo allows for precise and immediate delineation of the shape of the ASD and the relationship to the surrounding structures. It allows us to determine whether there are multiple fenestrations. It allows us to measure the maximum and minimal defect diameters, as well as the area of the ASD, without the need to evaluate the defect in serial multiple planes, as I mentioned previously. And we can use the multiple slice function to create multiple on-fast short axis views of the atrial septum to really understand the relationship of the ASD, the surrounding rims, and other structures, important structures such as the aorta or the atrial roof, to evaluate the extent and candidacy for uh, closure. 
This is an image that shows that ASDs come in different shapes and different sizes. So these are, these are three-dimensional images of an ASD as viewed from the uh, left atrium. And what you can see is that there are small defects and large defects, and the shape of the defects are actually quite variable. What I also want you to notice is that uh, the location of an ASD can also vary. These can live superiorly, inferiorly, anterior, posterior, and this obviously affects the surrounding rims of tissue, but it also affects the way a device would interact with surrounding structures. A very superior ASD may, may be uh, fine in terms of the rims of closure, but it may interact with the domes of the atrium, and that could potentially be a problem for erosion. So you have to make note not only of the size and the shape, but the location within the septum. Panel A indicates a relatively central atrial septal defect. Panel B is a large defect that's basically a complete defect of septum primum. Panel um, B, on the other hand, is, uh, is a little bit more anterior and superior. Now, this is a suggested protocol for how to perform the three-dimensional echo. And again, there's a complete protocol in our document. The, the images can be obtained from a bicable or from a uh, short axis view in the transesophageal echo. And once you've lined up your planes appropriately and acquire the volume, then it's simply a matter of rotating the volume down to display the image from the left atrial perspective looking at the atrial septum in panel D, or rotate the image toward the right to uh, view the uh, interatrial septum on FOS from, as shown in panel F. So once you've acquired the images, it's simply a matter of rotating the images to look from the left or right atrial side. And this slide shows the same thing, but a little more clear and zoomed up. And you can see on FOS views of a patient with a patent foramen of alley from the left atrial side and the right atrial side. Again, I want to point, you, point your attention to the exit of the, of the foramen in the left atrium, which lives close to the aortic mound. Okay. And here you can see a portion of the left atrial appendage and the right superior pulmonary veins coming in as well. On the right atrial side, you can see the fossa ovalis here, and the foramen ovale would be hidden anteriorly in this area here. Now, this is an example of a patient with an ostium secundum ASD as imaged from a 3D transesophageal echo. And what we can see here, again, on the two-dimensional images is a medium to large secundum ASD with deficient anterior aortic rim, uh, aortic rim, I should say here, left to right color Doppler flow from the left atrium to the right atrium. And here, the right atrial perspective looking at the ASD, and you can see the shape is uh, relatively uh, elliptical. And you can see the anterior rim, which is the area of interest uh, in this particular patient. We'll want to look at this in multiple views, and I'll show you that in a moment, to be able to understand the extent and severity of the rim deficiency and whether the patient is a candidate for closure. 3D echo also allows you to very quickly and easily recognize whether there are multiple defects. And this is a patient with a multifenestrated uh, interatrial septum, an atrial septal aneurysm with multiple communications, Swiss cheese, if you will. And you can see that on the two-dimensional image when we, when we find the right still frame, we can see multiple defects, and certainly we can see multiple color Doppler jets from left to right. But when we process the three-dimensional images, you can see here the interatrial septum and multiple defects, which is exactly what we saw when the patient went for minimally invasive laparoscopic surgery to close these defects. Uh, in this still frame image, you can also see a uh, mobile Chiari network here in the interatrial septum, um, nicely shown there. Now, I mentioned when we do have an atrial septal defect and we want to, we want to evaluate the uh, surrounding rims, this is looking at a relatively circular, medium to large size ASD from the right atrial perspective and from the left atrial perspective in panel C. And again, noting the shape of the defect, which is circular, we would want to measure the diameter of the defect in multiple views using the uh, 3D software. And what we also want to pay attention to is the uh, rims of tissue that surround the defect. And here you can see this is the aortic rim, which you can see right here. And this is a deficient rim, which lives right around the aortic mound and the aortic valve. And you can see it again in this view here. And not only noting the, the, the diameter of, I'm sorry, not only noting the, the length of the deficiency of the rim, i.e. this is only several millimeters of tissue, but noting the extent of the deficient aortic rim is extremely helpful in understanding whether this is a patient that could or could not have an uh, atrial septal defect closed percutaneously.
Uh, this is an image that hopefully this uh, movie will play for us, but this is an image using the multi-slice feature of a patient with a secundum ASD, a little smaller ASD, and we're making multiple slices through the interatrial septum to be able to uh, characterize the defect and understand the extent and the severity of the rim deficiency. And the movie is a little choppy, uh, but what you can see here on the bottom is when the image, uh, when the image stops, you can see the extent of the rim uh, deficiency. Again, this, uh, this movie plays a little bit better in the online version that I'll direct you to, and there's a nice illustration of it in the um, chapter. Now, let's talk a little bit about percutaneous transcatheter closure of these defects. And I've included here uh, some illustrations of some, but not all, of the devices that are used to close ASDs, the Amplotzer device in panel A and the Gore uh, devices in panel B and C, and a cartoon indicating how this is performed from a transvenous access. So this brings us to another audience uh, polling question. And I'm going to, again, encourage you to vote uh, now for what you think is the best answer and realize that there may be more than one correct choice. So which of the following atrial septal abnormalities are amenable to percutaneous transcatheter closure? Beaten foramen ovale, osteum primum ASD, osteum secundum ASD, sinus venosus ASD, or unroofed coronary sinus? Go ahead and enter your votes now for what uh, defects you think are amenable to percutaneous transcatheter closure. And again, uh, there may be more than one correct answer here, not a single choice. Great. So we're showing the results, and the vast majority of the audience said that osteum secundum ASD uh, is amenable to percutaneous closure, and that's absolutely correct. And then some of you also said that patent for amen ovale is amenable to percutaneous closure, and that's absolutely correct as well. Osteum, osteum primum, venosus, and unroofed coronary sinus are not really traditionally felt to be amenable to percutaneous transcatheter closure, although there are some case reports of unroofed coronary sinus being occluded with, um, with a, a, cat, a catheter-based device, obviously not intended for that purpose. Now, pain frame in a valley in the United States is not an approved indication for transcatheter closure, as the randomized clinical trials have failed to demonstrate a convincing benefit of PFO closure and reducing the risk of paradoxical embolism. That being said, it's important to acknowledge that, um, that there are patients that physicians feel are appropriate for PFO closure who have failed conventional medical therapy or very high risk of recurrence, and they're treated as part of a high-risk device exemption or off-label use. Osteum secundum ASD is a currently approved indication for the transcatheter devices and really is the best use of the devices currently. I've listed here some of the indications for ASD and PFO closure, but I want everyone to realize that there is a moving target here. The potential indications include a secundum ASD with evidence for a significant shunt and signs of right ventricular enlargement and volume overload. In the setting of a PFO, cryptogenic stroke is a potential indication, but as I mentioned, randomized clinical trials have still not proven conclusively that PFO closure reduces the risk of recurrent episodes, and therefore it's still considered investigational. It is not FDA approved in the United States uh, to percutaneously close a PFO to reduce the risk of paradoxical embolism. Contraindications for closure, and these could be absolute or relative, include a, a very small defect that does not have a significant shunt and no signs of RV volume overload, and this applies primarily to atrial septal defect. Similarly, if you have a very large defect that really exceeds the capability of current devices, such as a 38 millimeter or more diameter defect, that would be one that we would refer for surgery. Multiple defects that are unsuitable for closure uh, are also uh, relative contraindications. And if the device is too close to any of the surrounding structures, such as the cava, the pulmonary veins, the AV valves, or the coronary sinus, that's a caution as well. Rim deficiency is one of the key things that we see as a potential contraindication. And again, a deficient rim is considered less than five millimeters of tissue, and there are six rims that we look at uh, carefully to determine whether or not a patient is a candidate. If there are any other associated congenital abnormalities that would require cardiac surgery or anomalous pulmonary venous drainage, those are patients that are better served with surgical correction than percutaneous exposure. An ASD with very severe pulmonary hypertension and bidirectional or right-to-left shunting would not be closed percutaneously. And if there's extensive intracardiac uh, thrombus, that's a relative contraindication for closure until the thrombus has resolved. 
Now, in guiding procedures, ASD or PFO closure, TTE is clearly the least invasive imaging modality and can be used to guide smaller or pediatric patients, but as many of these patients are under general anesthesia for that procedure, they'll typically have transesophageal echo or intracardiac echo guidance, which offers even better resolution and even better imaging. TEE provides detailed imaging during percutaneous transcatheter closure, and intracardiac echo provides imaging that's comparable to TEE and has emerged as an alternative to TEE in some centers. It is the preferred imaging modality. You have an expert interventionalist that's, um, that is truly expert at performing intracardiac echo. They may be able to uh, evaluate the intraatrial septum and perform the procedure comprehensively without the need for additional echo support. 3D Echoes offers real-time imaging of the atrial septum, providing a comprehensive analysis of the defect and its relationship to surrounding structures, and uh, we believe it adds additional value. We use it for our most complex, high-risk patients. Regardless of the modality used, however, a complete assessment of the defect and surrounding uh, rims of tissue should be performed. Now, we always perform balloon sizing and closure of atrial septal defects, and during this time, what we do is apply color Doppler and we uh, perform a slow inflation of a balloon that's been passed across the atrial septal defect until we see cessation of color Doppler flow. This means we've occluded the defect and we're going to then measure the diameter of the balloon in the atrial septum in multiple imaging planes to determine the maximum balloon diameter, which will help us in the sizing of the device used. Again, a complete assessment of the closure device, the atrial septum, and the surrounding structure should be performed before the device is released. These devices are positioned evaluated, and then released only when we're satisfied that we're happy with the results and the device is appropriately positioned, appropriately occluding the defect, and not interfering with surrounding structures. Careful imaging should be performed to identify the presence of atrial septal tissue between the discs, and this is often easy to see in the aortic rim, but care must be taken to identify posterior and inferior rims, which can be a little bit trickier to see. Now, here you can see still frame images from an ICE-guided uh, ASD closure. And again, in panel A, you can see an osteum secundum atrial septal defect, and panel B is demonstrating a side-by-side -side with and without color Doppler. The yellow arrow indicates a large secundum ASD. A guide wire is placed across the defect using echo imaging into the left superior pulmonary veins, and over the guide wire, a, a guidance catheter is placed into the left atrium, as you can see here. We then pass a balloon um, to balloon size the defect, and the, the balloon is basically uh, positioned across the ASD, equally in the right and left atrium, and then slowly inflated with the application of a wide color Doppler window to look for cessation of flow. The yellow arrow in panel A indicates continued flow, whereas in, uh, in uh, panel B we're seeing the images without color Doppler. Once we've seen cessation of color Doppler flow, then we will measure the diameter of the defect, the waist of the balloon, if you will, which you can see here and here, again, once the color Doppler was stopped, and that indicates the diameter of the defect. That will help us in facilitate choosing the size of the uh, device. We always compare the static diameter, the maximum diameter of the defect, to the balloon size defect before we consider the final size of the percutaneous closure device we're going to use. Panel B shows the chosen device being placed with the left atrial disc, in this case an Amplotzer device that's opening up, has opened up, and is now going to be withdrawn back, as you can see in panel C, to the interatrial septum. We monitor this carefully under intracardiac or TEE or TTE guidance to ensure that the left atrial disc remains on the left atrial side of the septum. Once we're happy with the position and the device is not prolapsing back into the right atrium, then we deploy the right atrial disc. We want to ensure that we've grabbed on to the uh, surrounding tissue, and we really want to make sure that we've created a septal sandwich, if you will. We're going to interrogate the device in multiple views, and here in panel D and panel E, you can see both the, the superior and inferior portions of the septum are shown uh, coming into the device. And I hope you can see my mouse moving here, but the device there and there. And we want to ensure that the septum primum is coming into the device and septum secundum is being grabbed by the device, indicating an appropriate position. 
Now, this is an echo image of a three-dimensional intracardiac uh, echo, uh, and you can see, again, the image, the, the, the movie is playing back a little bit choppy on my system, and I'm not sure how it looks to you guys, but we pay careful attention to the device interaction with the surrounding tissues, and in this case, we're paying attention to the uh, paraaortic region, which you can see uh, right in I apologize for the choppy video, but it's playing back very choppy on my system. Um, these are 3D TE images of a transcatheter closure, panel A indicating the um, guide catheter and the device being deployed in the left atrium through the circular ASD. Panel B demonstrates the continued opening of the left atrial disc, which is then withdrawn back to the intraatrial septum. Now, what I want you to notice is that panel C also indicates by the white arrow that the device is relatively undersized, and using this and multiple other views, there was a residual defect. We upsized the, the device. We used a larger device, and you can see panel D indicating an appropriate size closure device, which is now completely occluding the defect. Again, we want to be careful to ensure that we've assessed the surrounding areas of tissue, and we certainly don't want to encroach on the atrial domes or the roofs of the atrium, and we want to make sure that we've evaluated the device as it relates to the aortic rim, the posterior rim, both ensuring this septal sandwich, this tissue that's inserted into the device, and then obviously using color Doppler flow to look for any residual shunt. This is an intracardiac echo image demonstrating a non device which has uh, been deployed, and there's a normal small amount of residual shunting prior to thrombosis and endothelialization of the device that does occur. Here is a TEE image of a similar device being deployed, again, looking at it from the left atrial side, and you want to pay attention to the surrounding areas and ensure that this device is not interacting adversely with the roof of the atrium, the aortic region, or the atrioventricular valves. You can see corresponding two-dimensional images from orthogonal planes, and this is a device that's undergoing a push-pull maneuver to ensure stability. We gently tug on the device and advance on the guiding cable to ensure that the device is stable. Now, one thing that's important to mention is that erosion can occur following percutaneous transcatheter closure. This is an extremely rare but potentially fatal complication. The risk of this has been estimated at 0.1 to 0.3%. When it occurs, it typically occurs at the roof of the right and left atrium or at the junction of the aorta. This can result in hemopericardium, tamponade, a fistula, and death. Most of the cases have been reported early within the first 72 hours, but there are case reports out there occurring up to six years. Imaging alone won't solve the erosion issue, but uh, imaging and high-quality imaging will provide additional data to help analyze the root cause. Erosion is assumed to be related to the abrasive mechanical force between the human tissue and the device as opposed to inflammation or an allergic reaction. Again, imaging may help us identify patients who are at risk for erosion, such as aortic rim deficiencies, uh, device patient mismatch at the atrial roof, or impingement of the aorta prior to release. So high-quality data is important, and high-quality imaging goes into that. Here's another uh, audience uh, polling question for you, the last one in the session. Which of the following are potential risk factors for erosion of a percutaneously placed ASD closure device? Rounding rims of tissue greater than 5 millimeters in all six segments a centrally located ASD, the presence of a pericardial effusion, or the diameter of a device equal to the maximum measured ASD diameter. And there is a single best answer for this question. There's not multiple answers that are correct. All right, so let's go ahead and see the results. And this is an interesting uh, question. Uh, some, uh, there's a, there's a, a, a group that said surrounding rims of tissue, the other group said the presence of a pericardial effusion, or the last group, the most common answer was the diameter of the device used is equal to the maximum measured ASD diameter. And the correct answer is the presence of a pericardial effusion. And so I, I think that it is important to say aloud that when you see a pericardial effusion after an ASD or a PFO closure, you have to be very suspicious of erosion, and you need to evaluate the device very carefully. It is the canary in the coal mine. It is the harbinger of uh, the possibility of erosion. Now, the other answer is surrounding rims of tissue of more than 5 millimeters. That's actually good. The more surrounding rim of tissue you have, the better. 
Essentially located ASD is less likely to perforate, uh, especially when it's not uh, massively sized, because there's, again, there tends to be surrounding rims of tissue, and, it tends, and the device tends not to interact with the uh, surrounding structures. And the diameter of the device equal to the maximum measured ASD diameter, that's actually not a bad thing. It's only when we start supersizing the device, when we use a device that has a diameter of one and a half or more than one and a half times the maximum measured ASD diameter that we potentially get into trouble. Now, these are the potential risk factors for erosion, and, I, and I've listed them here for you, but I want to emphasize that there is no root cause that's been identified, and there's no consensus in the imaging or the interventional community as to what the real cause of erosion is. It's been suggested that the most common feature of patients with erosion are deficient uh, rims, especially the deficient aortic rim. And if you have an absent aortic rim at zero degrees, the so-called bald aorta, that has been suggested to be a risk factor for erosion. But this is present in a large percentage of ASDs in general, and many of them are able to be successfully closed without erosion. So that's not the whole story. A very superior, uh, a deficient superior rim in multiple views has been implicated. A very superior location of the ASD has been implicated using a very oversized device where the diameter is much greater than the stop flow diameter, the static diameter. A dynamic ASD that's getting more than 50% bigger and smaller with systole and diastole. The use of certain devices has been, has been suggested as a potential risk factor. A malaligned defect where the septum doesn't line up with, uh, with the two parts of the septum don't line up with each other where there's tenting of the atrial septal free wall after placement of the device into the transverse sinus superiorly, or if the device is wedged between the posterior aortic wall and the aorta, so-called splaying, and obviously a pericardial effusion present after device placement is a, is a major red flag that um, we may have an erosion. Now, here's an example, again, of a deficient uh, uh, again, this movie is playing a little bit choppy, and so I apologize for that, but this is an osteum secundum ASD with a deficient rim, and uh, again, this is a patient that we would want to pay close attention to as we close, if we were considering closure of their ASD to determine their candidacy based on this rim deficiency. Here's a TE view, and again, a three-dimensional image that you can see here. This is the so-called uh, bald aorta. There's no rim. At, uh, in the uh, four or five chamber view, as you can see here, and you can see this really minimum wisp of rim here. So this is, this is a very deficient aortic rim. You can see no rim here, and you can see the problem. Here's the ASD. It's not a large atrial septal defect, but there's an extensive aortic rim deficiency that, that's, that's occupying about 40% of the circumference of the defect. And this would be tricky. Um, if you used an Amplotzer device, you would run the risk of rubbing the device up against the aorta displaying the device, and that may be a suboptimal position that may be a potential risk factor for erosion. Here again, you can see a different patient with an atrial septal defect, secundum atrial septal defect, and again, that so-called bald aorta, which you can see here. And again, when we look at this uh, moderate to large defect, again, you can see the irregularly shaped ASD, but this very extensive area of aortic rim deficiency, here's the aorta here, uh, that would indicate a potential for erosion. This is a patient that we're going to want to be very careful about prior to considering percutaneous closure. Here, on the other hand, is a smaller atrial septal defect, but with lots of aortic rim. And we love to see these patients because if they need to be closed, there's plenty of tissue to grab onto, and there's no fear that this patient will ever have a problem with their aortic area. We'll also want to pay attention to the superior and inferior areas, but the point is that these on FOS views give us a much clearer picture of the extent and the severity of the rim deficiency and are highly recommended for assessing patients. In addition to the uh, looking at that aortic region, we also want to pay careful attention to the roof of the left atrium. Here's a TEE from a patient that's undergone transcatheter closure in the lab. And again, what we want to see is that the device is not interacting with the aorta. It's not uh, impinging or pinching or pushing into the aorta here. And we also want to see that it's not rubbing, pinching, or impinging on the superior aspect of the intraatrial septum in your short axis and long axis views. And we pay careful attention to all of the surrounding areas to ensure that the device is not interacting inappropriately. Now, I'm going to end with this case of a patient who underwent erosion. And this, is, this was a patient that had uh, an amplexer uh, atrial septal occluder placed 
six years ago, and this is a relatively late erosion. Here we can see the device. This is the implant TEE. This was not performed at any of our institutions, but a case that was sent to us for review, and you can see the device is heavily splayed. The left atrial arms and the right atrial arms are splayed out. I'm going to move my mouse because that seems to mess with the images, are splayed out around the aorta. There's still a small residual shunt, but what I want you to see is the degree that this device was oversized to close the defect. Well, six years later, the patient presented with a hemopericardium, cardiac tamponade, and had, um, had the pericardial effusion drained, and it was blood. Formed the transesophageal echo, and this is our transesophageal in one representative image, and you can see the device, which is impinging upon the atrial wall uh, up around the aorta, and you can see hematoma in the pericardial space here. And this is a characteristic feature of erosion. So the hematoma is here in the pericardial space, and the device has eroded here at the superior aspect of the left atrium around the aorta. There was also a similar erosion in the right atrial um, uh, roof, and uh, that had to be repaired as well. This patient was sent for surgery and did great. He had the device explanted. A patch was placed over the intraatrial septum, and the hemopericardium did not recur after the device was removed. This is a summary slide that looks at some of the complications of percutaneous transcatheter closure and the role of echo. I won't take you through all of this in detail in the interest of time, but what I do want you to see is that echo is critical to the recognition of complications, the diagnosis of complications to exclude other competitive etiologies, and, um, and in following these patients and managing their complications after they occur. The last thing that we'll talk about is follow-up, and TTE plays a central role here, where TTE is performed on all patients prior to hospital discharge, and if you use an Amplatzer device, it should be repeated at the one-week mark, because remember, most erosions occur within about 72 hours. Follow-up evaluations with transthoracic echo should be performed at 1, 6, and 12 months after the procedure, and subsequently every 1 to 2 years after that. And again, one point to take home is that a post-procedure pericardial effusion should heighten awareness of potential erosion and should be promptly evaluated. Now, one of the moderator comments um, that I just wanted to mention is uh, someone, someone pointed out that uh, the presence of an effusion is really an indicator of erosion as opposed to a risk factor, so bad on me for giving a poorly uh, worded question, but I did want to underline the, the, uh, the effusion and uh, erosion connection and make sure everybody listening to the session knew that um, that, that was the case. So, in conclusion, uh, a comprehensive systematic echo evaluation of atrial septal anatomy and associated abnormalities, including the detection and quantification of the size and shape of the defects, the rims of surrounding tissue, the degree and direction of shunting, remodeling and changes in size, of, uh, change in size and function of the cardiac chambers and pulmonary circulation is essential. And this really requires us to integrate our findings across transthoracic, transesophageal, and intracardiac echo imaging. And a standardized imaging approach and nomenclature has been presented to facilitate this. The 3D is playing an increasing role, and I think that that has contributed significantly to the evaluation of the atrial septum and percutaneous and surgical therapeutic interventions, and we've listed a few future uh, imaging directions uh, for you to consider there. Once again, I want to emphasize that this was a joint uh, effort between a large number of really talented people, adult and pediatric echocardiographers, sonographers, uh, as well as imagers and, uh, and interventional cardiologists. It, this, this document is really an enormous effort on the part of everyone's part, and I really want to acknowledge the tremendous contribution that they have made. Now, I know that we've run over in terms of time, but I would like to uh, read a couple of the comments, uh, and uh, one of them, and I won't read your names, I'll keep everything anonymous, but one uh, uh, commenter uh, says that, in our experience, billing codes don't allow for the interventional physician to bill for the device closure and bill for the TEE. Please share. So we've shared that. But we are able to bill for the interventional procedure and the intracardiac echo, and in our institution, that works perfectly well, and we are able to bill for um, the TEE when performed by a separate operator versus the interventional cardiologist. So when I go do a TEE in the cath lab, I perform the TEE, and I bill for the TEE but my interventional colleagues were the ones that are billing for the closure procedure. There was another question about echo navigator, um, multimodality imaging that co-registers uh, fluoroscopy 
as well as echocardiographic imaging, and all I can say is that it holds great promise. I'm not sure that it's going to have a big impact in ASD or PFO closure, but it absolutely is going to be a powerful tool in TABR, MitraClip, paravalvular leak closure, uh, et, et cetera. So I think that, um, that, uh, that co-registered multimodality or fused imaging from fluoroscopy, CT, echo uh, is the future, and I think it's going to be a really important modality and a really important technique. Whether it has a role here or not, uh, we'll see. Uh, and I think that, that's, um, that that is an important question that hopefully some of you will help us answer. There was another question about 3D printing. Are we using 3D printing? And I think that that is another really interesting and important question to underline. The 3D printing is exploding now in structural heart disease, and I think that we're seeing now um, lots of uses of 3D printing to help model how devices interact with specific anatomies, the idea being you get a 3D data set from... EE or from a CT scan or an MRI, and then use that to 3D print a model of the patient, and then understand better how a specific device would interact with that particular patient. And I think that that obviously opens up the possibility of um, uh, customized, you know, custom created devices for specific patient anatomies, but we're obviously not there yet. That's an exciting uh, possibility that I think will happen. Uh, another person asked, how many injections do we uh, use performing, uh, how many injections do we perform to evaluate a PFO? Uh, they suggested three. Uh, we also uh, recommend that it's at the minimum performed at rest and with Valsalva maneuver, and I think a, a, a second one at, at rest is always a good idea. So three sounds like a great number as a minimum number of bubble studies, but again, one of them would include provocative maneuvers for ASD. Obviously, we're with the patients, and we can determine whether they performed adequate maneuvers, and I'd never be shy about doing a fourth or fifth maneuver if I wasn't comfortable that the patient really um, really was able to um, give us a good Valsalva. Uh, the last question that I'll answer, and I know we're, we're run, we've run over on time, so um, again, there's so many great questions, and I would love to answer all of them, but, but I don't want to hold you here forever, but um, the, the, the the question was, do you use the right atrial or the left atrial on phosphuse to measure the surrounding rims of tissue? And we, we tend to um, uh, use the, the, um, the left atrial on phosphuse to line everything up, but we're actually measuring the rims of tissue from the 2D data. So when you put the 3D volume into your 3D imaging software, you line up your on phosphuse plane and display that. And we tend to display the left atrial uh, on FOS view, but we're actually making the measurements with um, the corresponding 2D images from that plane. Um, the, and so let me let me stop there. Um, this, this, the, the quality of the questions is is absolutely phenomenal, and I wish I could read all of them. Uh, but in the interest of time, I uh, I won't. I want to thank everyone for their attention. Um, we will um, we will get uh, the materials out to anyone that's interested in that, and I really uh, I really enjoyed uh, uh, putting this session together for you. And again, I uh, strongly encourage you to look at the document that's put put together by these wonderful, talented people, and uh, and use it as a resource as you uh, evaluate these patients. Thank you very much for your attention.